Hi, I'm Anna. And I'm Ben. We're autosave. Welcome to our channel. Today we're watching Attack on Titan, Season 4, Episode 23, Annie and Hitch. Annie and Hitch. Annie and Hitch, Annie and Hitch, and Annie and Hitch. Annie and Hitch. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Annie and Hitch. I don't know if we've ever gotten a title card like that. Todas. So Hitch isn't with a line. The division is starting. The majority's behind him. I love this song so much. Riot gear. The ultimate riot gear just woke up. Oh, I'm so excited! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Wonder who taught you that. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what it is, because I don't remember being this, like, obsessive crush-like feeling towards Annie when we, like, you know, end of season one. But I don't know if it's just, like, absence that ma I, has I made my heart. I think because we've been waiting for her to come back all this time. Yeah. That is why it, like, is so fulfilling and exciting to see her again. They didn't let us forget, either. You know, like, I, I, I think once we got into season two, when was it? When we had the Reiner Aaron fight with the Colossal right after they unveiled themselves and we got Aaron's like reminiscing about Annie training him or training together. It's like, oh my god, I'm just so excited. <laughs> she heard everything. Oh my god. Yeah. Like she's been awake this whole time. So she's aware of Armin's visits, too. You and Armin. <laughs> she's already filled in. <laughs> okay, how's Annie gonna feel about it? Damn. We gave it no thought. God。God。she just wanted to go home, dude. A foreigner with Eldian blood. To give him so much better. Jesus Christ. 
あの時は<笑> What a similar idea to Zeke and Aaron. Sunset. Oh my god. Oh, thank god they've kept Hitch as a character. She's the perfect bridge. <laughs> God, they're all like, what? Mass hallucination, have to be. の中枢を先ほど同じ遅くなりし弔った<笑> Some great lines. He's going after Connie. Okay, a, d a fair deduction. Holy shit. What you want to do? さん、兵長は殺されたかもしれない。兄、兄が復活したかもしれない。もう兵団の指揮権。傷でも危険になるかもしれない。自分兵が集まると、ニコロの立場も危うだか考える余裕はないよ。それくらいわかるだろう。う
Did he really know this whole- Ah! ならしによって全ては巨大なアジアとの差だ。立ち義勇兵がこの島に来たと勝ってくれるものがいるなら声を上げよ。エルディア人と全部帰る。だけでなくとやろう。誰がお前だけに。ってことだけ。義勇兵
and it leads into the Irwin decision with Armin, and now look at where the fuck... Brings up. Like, it's crazy. I I That was brought up, you know, in this episode, too, with Armin. And the wildest thing is that it makes complete sense based off of what he said on that rooftop. And he... And what he said on that rooftop wouldn't have made sense if Irwin didn't give the speech that he did. Mm -hmm. Everything is so perfectly fallen into place with Flock's character that it is astonishing how compelling of a... I I wouldn't say villain. uh, How compelling of a presence he can hold on screen. You know, it's it's nuts. And we got something from him, you know, that I think kind of uh, shocked me a little bit. And that was us hearing that Aaron had told Flock his plan, making us think that Flock might be the person that Aaron told about this. But what I find interesting when I try to, like, think about the whys of that, I start to think of, like, okay, so if you want something to go a certain way, you would start manipulating people early. And I think Aaron must have thought Flock was the perfect person to manipulate into, you know, if someone confides in you, they're, they're, I think we're on the same page and I want you to be the one that helps me bring my dream to life. Like you're already kind of manipulating this person into thinking that they are special, doing the right thing, uh, someone that you are equals with. Um, And so he was already laying this groundwork for Flock to really be the one that did everything. Yeah. And by giving him those little boosts of confidence, I'm like, yeah, buddy, I'm telling you everything. 90% of my brain agrees with you. And and it's substantiated and backed up based off of that conversation that Flock had with Aaron and Armin after the decision was made. And Flock being like, Armin wasn't the right one to keep alive. We need a devil. And that's when Aaron's like switch flipped and was like, I know exactly how to fucking <laughs> I'll be use his devil. Person. I'll be the devil. And I'm going to show him how much of a fucking devil I am. You know, uh, not like with that malice, but like that intent of being able to use him. Te- like I said, though, like 90 ish percent, 10 percent of me is skeptical that Aaron told Flock anything. Only because Ooh. Flock has every piece of information he would need right now Already. to make up that lie. Right. Okay. I like that kind of 10% train of thought because it also is an intimidation tactic. Yeah. If he pretends in front of even Aaron's close friends, yeah. in front of Jean, he's even kind of decreasing Jean's like confidence that he knows Aaron. In front of Aaron. Mikasa too at the end, You right? know, like he is kind of devaluing everyone else in the room and putting himself up on a pedestal you know, having everyone else get a little more self-conscious that feels like they knew Aaron or Aaron... See, did Aaron not trust me to tell me this? And like, the, the the reason that I, I give even 10% to that is because when thinking about that other 90, I'm thinking of how Aaron could have been, or like, using Flock in a way. And when I think about Aaron, you know, trying to set up a situation for his advantage, I w- would think that I that this might happen. Because... To the rest of civilization within the island, the the, the closest hope you have to hold on to in terms of Eren not just being a thousand percent evil, kill everybody, and wanting to save certain people and his friends and caring about his friends, like, you have the whole, okay, John... Mikasa, these are all confidants of Eren. So much so that what's the girl who stole Mikasa's... uh, Gosh, Scarf's name. we say it all like we've said it and we've looked back to see what it is. Yeah, it's like Luis or something. Yeah, I think it's Luis. Um, uh, but regardless, the scarf's gone. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, but within that, we learn that everybody knows who Aaron's friends are mm-hmm. and how supportive and included they typically are in these plans based off of that interaction we had in the jail cell. So if Flock is able to use this information at hand to publicly show all of these people that he's the new real confidant, mm-hmm. he really is, the, he is the right hand man now, like, damn, the power that he will be able to gain right. from that. I want to go into that, but I also want to say that in a way, picking Flock would would have been if Aaron did consciously choose to pick Flock for this position and for this knowledge, I think it would also be smart in terms of what I believe is one of Aaron's goals, which is protecting the people that mean the most to him. Flock is a person uh, that loves to respect people, and he has respect for people. And I think Aaron would know that Flock wouldn't just uh, kill 
people that he had respect for and or he wouldn't do something that would upset Aaron. And so Aaron didn't even have to tell him, hey, don't kill my friends, by the way, even if they stand, if they won't like be submissive to you. Flock, I feel like automatically would have a really tough time convincing himself to shoot Jean. Yeah. And so Jean and Mikasa and everyone needs to play this really smart because Flock isn't going to immediately try to to kill them if they disagree. He's still trying to prove to them that this is like a good decision. I feel like this whole show he's doing for Jean, he knows that Jean's not on board, but he's doing this to try to convince Jean to be on board. Dude, say what you will about Flock. You can hate him rightfully so. You can call him stupid, and I could understand that argument too. You could call him the smartest person in the world, and I try to understand that too. <laughs> the one thing I will say that makes him one of the, like, such a compelling character is that it's not a one-for-one comparison in the slightest, but where you can see Zeke had Yelena, and we have seen so much of Yelena and how much power she can demand on screen with her reasonings and beliefs. We have everything and a thousand times more with Flock because we've gotten his backstory, his Mm -hmm. origin to a certain point. We, We know what led him here yeah and it makes sense and i love it i mean it was like let's pick someone who is really really traumatized and needs someone to believe in like obviously aaron kind of swooped in at a time where flock like needed to feel uh, stable like there was someone to follow mm-hmm. he he needed leadership that's what he wanted. It I mean, was, that's uh, a great theme to put in there is he wanted leadership that he could faithfully follow and trust in this person that they were going to dive head first also. And Aaron, it could be that for It him. goes back to your point of how easily manipulated he could have been, whether he was or wasn't. When somebody's in a vulnerable position like that and is outwardly opposed to the decision that had happened and is thus looking for an answer going forward, if you create that answer... You've earned something, or just you know. Create some stability. Yeah. You know, I honestly think that if anyone had stepped forward and had 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 the traits that I think Flock liked in Irwin, if anyone else had stepped forward in between that time before Aaron obviously did for Flock, then that person could Flock would be a follower of that person. I think it just needed to be someone who Flock could attribute. You know, take these attributes he saw in Irwin that he respected and that he was like kind of fixated on after Irwin's death and put it onto someone else. And then he would have followed that person. And Aaron just happened to be, yeah. uh, take advantage of the fact that he knew what Flock was looking for and he could fit the bill. I don't think we're going this route, especially with Aaron's character. But if there ever comes a day well, where Aaron kills Flock, it would be one of the coldest moments in anime history. Like, Flock's well, would like... Would Flock be, like, cool with it, though? That's no, 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 no. Like, Flock being like, Aaron, see, I've done everything you asked. Look, here's Jean and Mikasa. They're tied up. I killed all these people that you want. And it'd be like, bro, I didn't fucking care about you all along. But, like, it, I don't think that that's the way that they're going with Aaron's character in the slightest. But it would be kind of... Uh, when thinking about what we're going to end Flock as or leave him off or where his character is going to go, I wonder where it will go. Do you, know? you feel that possibly an end to Flock, whether death and or just lock him up in a jail cell, is more uh, Jean's responsibility at the moment narratively? Realistically, yes. 100%. Yeah. Because Aaron literally has bigger things to yeah, be, and to have like his I, attention. I, I yeah. like what you were saying, like, does Aaron even really care? Yeah. You know, I don't think one one person i mean with the power aaron has at the moment i really don't think that he would be like caring about someone that looks like an ant to him it is interesting that we haven't gotten any aaron uh inner monologue it is because we don't know and that makes like keeps that as a big question of what actually you know what actually is aaron's consciousness really like the one that is in control right now or if did it solidify itself so much that we know it, it, what Aaron's intentions are that they don't need to... We don't even need to, like, be hearing it. What yeah. if it doesn't even matter if there's an inner monologue because it's not like it'll change anything for yeah. us or and let us in There would be deeper. no purpose for it unless Zeke was still alive and arguing with him. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't just be him blankly talking to himself or if Ymir was, like, a third party there. Or if Armin and everyone was still trying to figure out what Aaron was thinking. Yeah. You know, at this point, it's kind of like, okay, here's the fact. Yeah. Aaron said it himself, and that's what matters. 
is what everyone is going to do in the meantime while this happens. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the story has like veered off of focus on Aaron and it's now like, what is everyone else going to do while Aaron does his thing? Well, I like that there's, there is a decent bit of acknowledgement from several characters in this episode being like, what the fuck are we going to do? Is there anything that we could even do? Like, or what, in, in, is it worth it? Do we want to do it? Like, Obviously, that's the whole dilemma. Yeah. Like, when Flock was speaking to all the volunteers, he was like... And then all those people were fight infighting in front of Hitch. You know, that idea of, well, it's the price that... They paid the price of making sure that some of us could survive getting slaughtered by the rest of the world. And if anything, some people and some faction of people are going to think of those people as heroes, uh, martyrs well, that, that that died for a greater good cause. We've talked like uh, last episode and the episode before about if there was anything anybody could even try to do to <laughs> stop Aaron. And we've also talked about if there was probably going to be a significant amount of people who are going to support Aaron and his decision and those who will not. And that we're able to like speculate on that that probably would happen like it did or it could continue to happen what i could not speculate on in the slightest like intelligent in an intelligent way would be how the fuck to stop aaron unless it was his own decision you know like and, a, and or, unless a, he didn't tell us everything i'm or not exactly the truth i've kind of left the uh train of thought of it like that that i even could begin to know what is best for this world I'm just saying, if characters want to go forward with the idea of trying to change Aaron's actions, I have no idea how they'd go about that, you know? Yeah, I, no I don't clue. think that they can pull a whole, like, everyone latching on to Bert Holt and, like, yelling things at him as, you know, to say things to try to make him stop. I, I my, my best goal, my best idea that I could think of is getting the rest of the titans that Aaron does not have and forming some sort of mega person <laughs> and going at him with that. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, a, I, can, I can imagine like it. Like kicking, kicking and screaming or Power Rangers, like making some like gigantic like combination or of titan. Or in some really, really horrible way, we feed all of the rest of the titans to Falco. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. Or Connie's mom. Or <laughs> Give all the Connie's, Connie's mom the power. Connie's mom is going to be the one that is going to fight Aaron. Dude, I, once we get to Connie, we will get there. once we get we'll to get Connie, there. I like Connie is Connie is Connie's going to die, bro. He's, <laughs> um, okay. We do think that he's going to die. Uh, we did say that. When beginning of the episode, we get some Hitch and some Annie. And some Annie. All of my expectations are met and or exceeded, and I am very glad that Hitch is here. Yes. It's great. it's great. I love I love them both. I love their character design so much. It was so nice to see Annie again. Especially, she, uh, I couldn't tell if she's, one, slightly animated different because it's a different animation studio. Two, I, I wonder if she has physically lost, like, weight mm. and uh, because she's, she's had to stay conscious. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I was thinking she looked gaunt. Yes, agreed. Because it, it's not... The word, the wordage we got wasn't that she was just chiming in for those times that she could heal, hear people talking. It's then when that wasn't happening, she just... all, she saw nothing, right? That sounds terrifying. Yeah. Literally terrifying. Uh, and, for, and for four, th honestly, so terrifying. I don't like to even... Could be like a coma. Yeah. You know? I mean, but it sounded a lot more like she was like, con like somewhat like miserable or in in a way i i kind of thought that she sounded like it was a not a fun time when it was pure darkness i wonder like could annie have broken out at any time like i assume that she could have because it seemed like she was the person who put herself in there in the first place right and she was alluding to being able to listen to everything that was going on meaning she would know when is the right time yeah and honestly if she's hearing armin just be like annie annie when are you gonna break out of there i like that could even be like a a bad move in a sense like then but i part of me like crazy ben is like like, did some third party or Aaron somehow, like, break her out on purpose? I don't know. I, uh, regardless, I 
am very happy that she's back and I'm very glad that there's something there with Armin because I imagine that they are going to meet at some point soon. Um, I wish we had a map in front of us because I almost feel like the the route that Annie yeah, but... and Hitch could be going mm-hmm. could directly uh, coincide with where Connie and yes. Falco and then Armin and... are going to be. So we have Armin and Gabby setting out. We have Connie and Falco. We have three horses and a titan with a horse and a carriage. We have all the titans. I meant like in terms of traveling. Yeah. We have a horse with Hitch and Annie. We have a horse with Connie and Falco. We have the horse with Armin and Gabby. And then we have a horse carrying Hanji and Levi next to a titan. The only way Levi could fight again unless there's some time skip of healing, is if he Have somehow gets the power of the uh, Titan, you yeah. know? And that's a scary thought. It's also a scary thought that Falco doesn't know he has the Titan. And doesn't and doesn't know. So, yeah, I know. Colt. He hasn't figured out what happened to Colt That yet. broke my heart, dude. And oh. obviously he's like, wow, this Connie man is such a nice guy. Yeah. Like, he's just so stupid that he doesn't realize where South is. Yeah. But he's I, nice, so... I know. You know. Okay, so w- Hitch had a great line to Annie, and that is that the most use she has ever done in the military police is cleaning up after Annie and Aaron. Yeah, the most meaningful Both thing times. that she's ever done. And I, I was like, holy shit, you, are, you hit the nail on the head, dude. Like that, and that's a real, um, that's something you have to live with. And it connects back to the fucking military police conversation that flock had with john later in the episode because correct me if i'm wrong the only way flock knows that about john would be from aaron or from just other people talking he wasn't there the whole time you know i'm sure people in the jaegerists were having uh chit chats you know about everyone that was kind of like aaron's friends and what all of their like kind of histories were kind of like you know like So you knew all the details about them, so you knew if you could, like, how much you could trust them, and, like, so you felt like you had a leg up on them in a way, because you kind of knew their their past. Yeah, I could see that. Um, Intel. Talking about intel, we got a whole lot of intel in regards to Annie and uh, her backstory. Yes. Um, There was a point a few episodes ago that I was, like, I felt pretty confident in knowing and knowing what to expect from Annie going forward, because the way that they were setting things up, it wasn't going to be any, like, crazy connection, like, between Zeke and Annie or anything. Like, I knew that a few episodes ago. And I was like, okay, her motivation's probably just wanting to go home. Never in my fucking wildest dreams did I feel like, did I think it would be as compelling as it was. Uh, because there there's something that I got packed away in such a small portion of this episode that really hit me hard about annie like the there was so much back to back to back getting left right uh on on a doorstep of like an orphanage basically and then being picked up by somebody who has their own ambition and is only going to use you and then it seemed like annie and her dad at the end of the day neither of them intended or realized that that fucked up that that bond that started Mm -hmm. from a fucked up place had consequences that neither of them ever expected it to have and that was just love for each other they're all each other had yeah i actual feeling of of familial love and like that's my daughter that's my father so he wanted to make her into a warrior to give himself a better life and that is something that i don't think i've thought about enough because when you have a child who becomes a warrior they are immediately given a death sentence. Regardless of if they die in war, you know that you're probably going to outlive them unless something else happens. I know, isn't happens. it? That's, I've never thought about it that way. That's yeah. so screwed up as a parent. Like, obviously, Grisha wanted it for this uh, grand, you know, to basically to create, like, Zeke into this. This person that would martyr himself for the cause of saving Aldea. Um but, but oh, out, like, no parent wants to outlive their child. No, but when you're, when you're this group of people who live in, in such a way that you have no chance or very little chance to better your life at all, and then a, various, a very obvious route is 
you know, presented to you at the cost of your own child in X amount of years, you're like, it, it must be a fucking weird feeling to be faced with that decision or opportunity, you know? Mm -hmm. Opportunity doesn't even sound right. Like, it's just a weird... I, I've never thought about somebody using it for their own benefit like that. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure maybe it was easier for him to first have that idea since he didn't have any attachment to Annie originally. He just picked her up from the street. It's not like he was m married to her mother and that she was literally, like, his, his daughter. Because then I think it would probably be like maybe even more messed up it's already messed up but he didn't have a connection to her in any way before picking her up mm -hmm. so it makes sense that it would have grown throughout the time together that and it makes even more sense because he'd been put there for similar reasons as mm -hmm. me so if he had been put there in a situation like her and had a life without he someone like, like him he would just prob he would probably assume annie's feelings and then un unintentionally give her a life or a connection at least that he never got mm -hmm. and i don't know it's it's interesting i didn't expect to um learn a decent bit about annie's dad which made me feel for the moment we got for him later in the episode even more right um so i you know with with how we got these flashbacks from annie originally a few seasons ago i thought she lived in the woods or had woods behind her house and that was all just by, I guess, the visual. It Same felt here. that way to me. Yeah. But then once we, we we went to Marley and I learned that all of the Eldians were within these kind of zones, it, I was like, oh, I guess there's maybe like a wooded area in one of the zones. Yeah. But then we see it and it's really just a few scraggly trees. Like I was thinking she was maybe a little well off in comparison maybe to some of the other people or maybe they lived maybe it's more rural so less well off but obviously like it was not a, a forest <laughs> yeah i definitely thought that it was in the forest as well and it was like maybe that they, they were even more poor or just you know they didn't have anything so this is what they fought for to get something mm -hmm. i but it's a lot more bleak i guess and like gray in tone and in visuals than I, think. I know once you like got uh, get the actual zoomed out view of like where their yeah. house was. It's like looks like right next to runoff of a factory, and I'm like, God damn it! Like, how many people in this in this whole entire world, which we don't know a lot of, you know, but how many people live a good life and deserve it? Are like are able to live a comfortable life and deserve it, and I think that that can be like a big metaphor for the world we live in. But like, it's just to be able to convey that in an anime is interesting. Mm -hmm. It's at um, the moment I feel like the only character that could be somewhat comfortable and deserve it for me at least is Historia. Yeah, like she, I, I, I highly doubt that Aaron would would have her be hurt in any way with this plan. I'm sure she was briefed to some degree of something that would keep her safe. So I feel like she's probably the one that's like, you know, the, mo well, <laughs> the most When it comes to deserving it, it, it brings me back to the whole Flock Jean conversation because Jean, a little bit before that Anyan Capone look, like Jean has been through a fuck ton of, like mm -hmm. uh, he's been through a lot of stuff, man. He, and he's one of the characters that I'm like, if the if the situation was right, of course I'd be like I'd be saying almost exactly what Flock did in the sense that it's like it's your time to rest now, dude. But obviously the way that we got here is hurting other people. So and that's not the type of person Jean is. But it's just like and that holy shit. That conversation ties back to Jean on the rooftop. Is was it last episode when they all woke up from this daydream? Of, of Aaron speaking, where Jean is the one articulating it to everyone, what kind of the truth of the situation is, and the awareness of the situation that this would benefit us. Mm -hmm. And it made it even better for him to have that conversation with Flock when he's the one that was the most aware of how beneficial this was for his personal life. Yeah. Uh, one of the last things I want to say about Annie is we have gotten several visuals of her like stepping on bugs and it for the first time i feel like i thought to it reminding me of the end of the intro when you see the footstep of the butterfly mm -hmm. do you think that there's any route that we could go down that annie and aaron come face to face again 
I don't even know where Aaron is, to be honest. I don't know if he's, like, located in a central position here or, or he's moving with the rest of the Colossals. I don't know if them coming face to face would have any actual uh narrative value other than being somewhat like maybe fan service to get some conversation like i don't know if narratively it w would actually do anything because i don't think annie could convince Aaron yes or no i don't know if i necessarily necessarily see annie being like yeah i'm gonna fight with Aaron. Uh, so I'm not really sure. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if it would actually like add anything like substantial to have them come like face to face right now. Yeah. I I think there are some other matchups that I think would maybe make more sense. Make or... more sense or be maybe more fulfilling or exciting for the viewer. Yeah. Um. I could see a potential Levi Annie interaction because of everything Annie did to the original Levi squad that we met. Um, that would, and you know who else is with Levi? Peak. I think Peak and Annie could also be <laughs> an interesting conversation because I feel like they might end up somewhat being on the same page. I don't know. Maybe in some universe, Peak and Annie might be able to get each other a little bit. I just want to watch all the characters sit down at the table and talk to each other Armin. and interact with each other. It'd be so much fun. Like, uh, know, <laughs> Armin and Gabby meeting up with Hitch and Annie. God, uh, okay, I, that's why... Uh, all of the horses need to in, somehow, like, echo location, find each other, and start running next to each other, and uh, we can, and just, they can all have a conversation as all the Shallot's, horses are, like, Shallot is parallel. the founding horse. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron might have the founding titan, but... But that is, that is, um, that is the founding horse. In the whole Annie bit, I wrote down Gabby, and I was trying to figure out why, uh, but that the whole parallel, bro, oh my the God. The praise for that's yeah, why. it's like it's so this, this good. Is same language it, it, as well, their motivations for for doing heinous crimes is that they got praised for, for doing people. these for killing people, for being weapons. But it it's so it's so good. It makes it feel justified. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, it's so good. It not sorry. I totally made that sound weird. It's not justified. I, it's not. No. I said it makes it feel justified to them. Sorry. No. <laughs> it, 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 but what it it wasn't necessary for annie to say that uh, as a character but when she is on the stage to which i think you might be alluding to justify herself to hitch and maybe have hitch understand her actions and why she did them it would make complete sense for that to be one of the answers because we've seen directly how that affects another character for the past season and literally as close as last episode and it's it's and it, after they come to these realizations what are they wanting to do now gabby and and annie are both have, are both now aware of the reasons why they felt justified in their actions and from that they are now kind of uh narrowing in on what is actually important to them yeah uh, and what is actually worth uh fighting for and i think for gabby here her main goal and hope is to to get to falco and to save falco and then just get them out of here honestly i think just getting falco having falco be safe and then for Annie, it's it's to get home to her father. They've kind of narrowed in and realized, like, yeah, all the praise was good and it made me feel good as a kid and it made me feel like killing people was okay. But what I really want is just to have the people I love be safe and be with them. Do you think Annie's dad is dead? Ah, uh, I think that that was a really dumb move if that got himself, if he got himself killed in that way. Because what, what what was the point of of acting up there i i get it like you wanted to fight for to see annie yes again. but it was silly when he has so many guns pointed at him i know but there's a lot of things happening okay and like he, really he's an emotional doubt, man yes. and his daughter has been uh predetermined is dead forever and he's the one person being like i know she's not dead and uh, I, it's so tragic and i in my mind i'm coping right now but the rest of the Eldians took took a step forward, and they all went after those guards. And he is still alive, at least in my heart for now. Um, would you like to read the midroll? I just couldn't see them all rioting. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm hopeful also that it wasn't like that he is dead. Yeah. <laughs> okay, midroll. 
Uh, the rumbling, used as a bogus threat by the 145th King Fritz to bring peace to Paradise Island for the past 100 years. Due to the vow renouncing war, the rumbling and its millions of colossal titans could not be put into motion until now. Following the collapse of Paradis Island, three walls, the march of the colossal titans flattens everything in their path. Now that the rumbling is underway, destruction of the world is not far off. <laughs> It's a very bleak mid-roll. I'm, I'm just like, what if, like, Aaron, like, slips up a little bit and, like, takes his eyes off the, like, off the road for a second and the Titans just loop back around and fuck over the island, too? Oh, no. How, how do you stop it once you've started it? Is I that don't even know. possible? And really, were 145 of the kings all named Fritz? Like, did they never get another name? Like We had you... a Fritz, you know? I know. The 145th King Fritz. Yeah. Which makes me think that all of the kings... I think so. ...were named Fritz. And, oh, he... You know, that original king, he already, you know, was gonna have his name live on, you know? And he just... It's so gross that he lives on even more, that his name just lives on literally See, forever and generation after generation. Ugh. You know what's really interesting? You and I have two different original King Fritzes. Yours is, makes more sense. But mine's the old dude in the chair who was just a marionette. That's my original he was King Fritz. Yes. When we found out that he like didn't like have like a like, cognitive like I idea of what was going on, yeah. I was that made me laugh in like after we like kind of finished that episode and mm -hmm. that situation. And I laugh about it a little bit now, just kind of how he was like, huh, what? What's going on? That dude probably had a great life. Honestly, like he was probably really well fed. He probably slept in like a really nice clean bed. Yeah. I don't know, man. You didn't have to do anything. What more can you ask for? Any in this political up work world? at yeah. all, <laughs> except sometimes like sending treats to like some of the like walled in areas that were less fortunate yeah and like they would put up like you know the little like flags everywhere for him yeah uh i like the transition of annie's dad and then it going black we us hearing the gunfire and then it goes to what's his name shade shady's shady's uh keith i think but yeah but uh like his whole conversation which was a, a great smart, a smart conversation too a great conversation because i like we we got I wrote down a line from it. What was it? Try not to lose yourselves. Yeah. I we I think I think we as an audience, like all of us, were meant to get a little bit of his intention when he let all these youngins beat him up, right? Like he like uh, very obviously didn't punch back much. He did he yeah, he did not fight back not, from what we could gather. Not that it wouldn't be reasonable for one dude to get beat up by 50 guys. I get that, but still, like w we know our dude and it fits in character that this is the route that he was going to take and for him to try to save these cadets a second time in a very similar way is i thought was great mm -hmm. i and i loved the idea of him being like i don't have much left but you guys better keep yourselves alive and if that day ever comes mm -hmm. then you stand up in an alternate universe like where we have keith shady's in this um obviously till the end uh in another dimension in another universe a, a different dimension aaron this is his dad <laughs> was in love with his mom yeah she probably would have married her if grisha hadn't come to town yeah like this is this is aaron's dad in another life and that's why he <laughs> is alive till the end yeah um mm -hmm. shortly after that we had the conversation between uh, okay i think taking it back this is my favorite moment of the episode when armin broke uh Oof. because and took it out on Mikasa. I think something that I don't look at enough in this show is the relationship between Mikasa and Armin. Mm -hmm. Because it's... It, you know, I don't okay. think we've spent much time talking about it at all, actually. Have you ever, like, been in a friend group with three people and it's all great and everything? And if you're one-on-one -on -one with one person in that group, it's great and fine. But if you're one-on-one -on -one with that other, that third person... It's like, yeah. It's yeah. a little awkward and shit. Because mm -hmm. they're mainly friends with the other yeah. one. And the, yeah. Mikasa okay, and Armin you. have always been great friends. But to put themselves... 
to put their minds through the trauma of losing Aaron in the way that they have they have and thought that they have right for years and only having each other to 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 tell each other th th there's no way right everybody else is accepting Aaron for who the, who who he is but they're like trying to find some justifiable reason it only in each other Th they're they're each other's sounding boards it's like they're looking in each other for the answers yeah and when armin has to deal with the weight of knowing that he was chosen mm -hmm. over not just anybody but the person then he's already dealing with a lot of shit and still trying to maintain some sort of composure for mikasa mm -hmm. and Mikasa having no fucking ill intent, of course, just trying to understand the situation better and how she can be helpful. Right, right. Armin just couldn't hate, like, he, the responsibility. he broke. He's like, uh, here he, he already is kind of looked at and known for this idea that he should be the one with strategies and he was saved over Erwin. And this is, the, it's almost like he was like, hey, I love you but I can't be responsible for what you do right now. I need to focus on myself and like everyone else and all this other chaos. And I need you to take care of yourself for yeah. today, for today, make your own decisions. Yeah. Like I love you. Yeah. It's just like, I, I really, really, really feel for Armin because I know that Mikasa is a very smart and very capable fighter, you know, but Armin has always been the person to set, things into motion in a way that I think a lot of people could agree with, you know, yeah, and success. He's always been rather successful with his, his, um, his thinking and his ideas. And I think Mikasa really respects and trusts in that. Trust is a great word because ever since that first time that Aaron trusted Armin and being like Armin, either we hop this wall, run away, we die, whatever. It's up to you. You make this decision. And Armin was the one to talk everybody out of it. I, like th th we we've all developed this trust into Armin mm -hmm. and it's different when you trust Armin as just Armin alone versus when you trust Armin as Armin carrying the weight of the world on his back mm -hmm. because everybody else is looking up to him now too right I remember not really knowing uh how Mikasa felt about Armin uh for a bit I I felt like obviously her she's really focused on Aaron and then when they gave us the scene of of Aaron and Mikasa on the rooftop trying to fight for Armin to be the one being saved that's when you see like that was like obviously there was like obviously Mikasa cared for Armin before that and she always was beside Armin but that is the moment that you see that she is willing to like kill someone yeah. for this person mm -hmm. and it is not just Aaron that she is willing to protect yeah. and fight for it is Armin as well I and that think... was a really emotional moment Armin's gotta be one of my favorite characters in the series and it's kind of like hidden uh and they don't let me see it a lot is the reason like all the reasons why I love him but I can see it in Mikasa's face mm -hmm. it tells a thousand words to know that Armin has been holding in his true emotions and feelings to try to benefit everybody else in the situation. And when he is, after the time skip, seemingly a person who's grown, is stoic, and, like, at least a bit more confident, and then when he breaks and starts looking like a, like like he did when he was a kid and he's mm -hmm. crying and he, does, he doesn't know what to do, the look of devastation on Mikas's face being, like, I can see what you've been fucking dealing with it's the like past he, few years, man. He put up this kind of exterior and she was maybe so busy that she didn't even notice. Possibly that could be a route that it could be, you know, underlying that, that that's also her reacting to being like, oh my God, I didn't even like, I should have been a little bit more, uh, aware and and delicate with uh the state or how Armin might be feeling. And maybe I wasn't even kind of thinking about him. Yeah. I, I, whereas everything that Armin said is true and warranted of a, and warrants a worried response of like, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. Mikasa wasn't reacting worried or scared because of the reasons that Armin gave. It was no. that Armin was breaking. It, and, it was a worry for, for him. It was a, uh, oh my God, has that been like in you all this time? Yeah. Like, I think, um, if I was in this world... 
Uh, I would wish that I was a type of person that could just uh, be more about strength in terms of like physical ability. I would not want to be a person like Armin who is currently kind of looked at and is a person to make decisions um, yeah. and to be thinking. And because because that means that Armin has to constantly constantly be thinking of every single like the chessboard, you know, he has to think about every player, where where they are, every piece. He has to think about all of this chaos. And in a way, Mikasa has somewhat of maybe, I mean, this it's not really a luxury, but the luxury of maybe only having to focus on uh, uh the thing of, oh, what do we do about Eren? And, oh, are you okay? This, this person I care about that's right yeah. in front of me. But Armin is thinking about everyone and everything. Even if he doesn't like truly care about it, like he has to, and um, because he I, would be looked at as the one that he he took the place of Erwin. Yep, he's the one that needs to think about everyone and not just himself and the people he cares about. I really appreciated all the different camera angles of uh, Armin and Mikas's faces too, all from different like directions of the room. I think it really helped the tone. But you just said something that reminded me of something that I thought of after uh, last episode and editing it you said the word chessboard i did i connected I chessboard for you. with pixies right pixies yes yeah that's one of the reasons i used it and then i connected that to a thought i had was pixies the first titan that armin ever killed it's good it'd be hard to say right now i mean it kind of be nice placement wise when Pixis's death is referenced in this episode yeah. of being like the core of our military has already been sliced through the nape. I took that as talking about him. Yeah. And I are we on the same page with that being a possibility of that I th- could be I who, think you could fit who that into was that. referencing. Yeah. Um I uh you know, I think if so. I were to think back, I, I know that Armin has killed a person. Yeah. Um cuz we had, you know, I'm had sure to deal he with has, that. But like it would be a fucked up Turn of but did he ever? Re- I don't know if he's ever really been the one to take take the final blow. Yeah. Remember that like scene where they're all in that like elevator thing, and all of the really great fighters are on the like rafter beams. Mm-hmm. I think I don't think Armin was in the rafter beams. I think he was in the elevator. I think so. It was a long time ago. Dude. It was a really long time ago. Well, I can't wait to rewatch the show. Right. Uh, so we're going on to the whole Flock John conversation. I only had a couple things I want to say about it that we haven't. Um, and I could totally be reading into this. But um, when Flock is talking to Jean and is saying, relax, Jean, I'm helping him understand. And it's right after he shot him in is the it, hand. Is it the line and about then he says, grasp the situation? He couldn't grasp the situation. <laughs> But I think he does now. Oh my god, so, it was so savage. So then I'm like, holy shit, did he mean it like that? And then right afterwards, John, uh, Flock's like, now everyone knows what happens if you decide to mouth off, which I assume would be getting shot in the fucking mouth and the head. To co- like, I was like, you are the coldest dude I have ever seen. Like, what the hell? And he's wearing this like headband that makes it's him look like, kind of cool. It's like his cute. head's bandaged, but someone like stopped mid treatment for him. <laughs> like, it's not actually doing. And is that is that bandage doing anything for him? Um, you know, like in, I don't know enough about in my like, canon wounds. In my canon, he put it on himself to look cool. He put it on himself to be like, I already got hurt, but I'm still being a badass. Flock reminds me of what I was like in high school. Like, Flock, rem- like, I was such a piece of shit, little edgy, like, edgelord. And I was like, <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, I have a soccer game today. Gotta get the hair out of my eyes, even if I didn't really need to. Got, like, a headband, put it down. I was like, I look cool, don't I? Like, like, like I Flock is, I, I don't know. You There's probably some... still feel like you look cool when you put headbands on. No. 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 Never. Um, but I Flock as a character is very interesting because like one dimensionally, two dimensionally, I can easily say so many things I dislike about him personally or can't believe you're doing this. But no, as a character and how he's written, you got to fucking approve. It's like hands so... hands down. Like it... All I can say is that I is wild and crazy what they what has happened with this this character and what they've turned into and when they were given to us and what moments they had and now kind of how they feel and how they act is just and how how willing and comfortable they are with killing and injuring people yeah. like I it's still so shocking to me because I'm like I'm still stuck in that whole 
well, when you when you thought these were titans, it was it was easier to to kill them and hurt them because they were these giant creatures that were trying you to eat know you. Either. But once it got to like the people killing people, we had obviously conversations with our men where it was like, well, they were gonna kill you if you didn't kill them. And then we get go to Marley and we see war, and then we come here and we see Marley fight the island, and then we see Flock just being like. I'm just gonna kill this guy because he mouthed off to me, and I'm like, Dude, oh my god. What this show is is like season like it, as it progresses, it shows not only us but every character in the world that it, it's not black and white. Mm -hmm. We start off the show, we have this gross, ugly villain, uh, like all these villains, as in the the Titans originally. We get the idea that there could be like traitors inbound from Erwin. We have Annie. Oh, that's the villain. Oh, and then these are villains, but they're also, they're us. The thing we've been killing is us, but I can still see some sort of clear path, right? And as it, you know, progresses and the road continues to be walked on, there's more and more debris and branches covering that clear path of what is right and what is wrong, you know? It's, it's not, like, I feel like I'm a character in the show. Right. And and some of the paths aren't too, too different in some in some ways. Yeah. Uh, like, if we're drawing this kind of triangle, or at least there's these two paths in front of Jean, there's these two people standing in front of him, and they are at, at an opposite. Um, and that would be Flock and Onion Capone. Mm -hmm. And that is the line of um, kind of awareness of your situation uh you've been your people have been slaughtered your people have been tortured but where are you going to go from that on your capone is like maybe i can protect you and you guys can protect my homeland and flock's like i don't give a shit about anyone else's homeland except my own i'm gonna save mine and i don't care if yours die even though your people were also slaughtered and also hurt which, which and then jean's just kind of standing here looking at both yeah of them. You know, and obviously I think he's going <laughs> to slide a little bit more towards Anya Capone on and that. It, but. And you know why we feel that way? And I truly believe John's going to do that is because that's what he always did. When he, he had the decision and the chance to go to the military police and he didn't do it. Because at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, Jean is guided by an internal, you know, morality. And I like that for him. Yep. Um, I... Coming up to the Falco and Connie conversation, if I was 65% sure Connie was going to die after last episode, I am easily 70% sure now. Mine went down. What? Yeah. After Connie was like lying to Falco about it and then telling him like, believe me, it's true. I was like, God, I no. I don't know. No, I, I think because of this conversation and because of knowing that there are tons of other characters like out and about right now, like on horses... Then now I'm like, I feel like it might be more fulfilling to have Connie be like directly like Falco in hand about to feed him, stared, stared down by Levi. Armin or Levi or Ponji, someone, someone kind of catching him about to act on this. And yeah. I think more like, I think it might be more fulfilling right now for his character narratively for him to make the decision. Uh, whether out of like embarrassment of himself or out of being caught and stopped, something along that line. Maybe he dies after that. No, I maybe. think maybe. I think you're onto something, and I think that that could very well happen. But it, he would still die. Yeah. I think he's dying. Oh, is his mom gonna eat him? I don't know, but I also had like an uh like an image in my head of what if like while riding or once they get closer and it's still just Connie and Falco. Falco like accidentally cuts his hand or something and then Connie starts to freak the fuck out and Falco's like why are you so scared you know and because he doesn't know yet I don't know I thought that could be I cool. mean like how do we know that Falco's not gonna get memories triggered at some point during this little excursion yeah good like, question he might start kind of seeing things from from Galliard from Porco yeah could be um last thing was Hanji meeting up with Peak, right? I was, the whole episode, I'm like, we have to get Levi and Hanji, if not this episode, the next one or two. And 
holy shit, this is going to be an interesting fucking, like, uh, turn of events going oh, forward. Both of them were, like, the right-hand woman to a blonde dude. <laughs> Zeke and Peek, yeah. and then Erwin and Hanji. That, they can... And now they're the the ones alive, and they are badass women. And they can they're bond about over to, that. They're about to have a conversation. I want to be a part of it. I like how it's just like, oh, yes, and this person you never asked about behind me? Oh, don't worry about him. He's not strong. He just doesn't want to die. <laughs> you know, like, when it when um you realize that a character has really, like, solidified themselves, like, in your heart? Yeah. Is that when Hanji walks up and says, like, hi, <laughs> I we've heard this voice actor, like, do that before <laughs> in the show, and I, it just, I, I, it was iconic for me, like how it sounded. I was yeah, like, oh, it was Hanji, great. It was, I love Hanji's voice. It was amazing. And like the the second that we get them, I'm like, oh, this is such a cool conversation. And then you just see Hanji walking up. Like, <laughs> I'm like, there's not, if you put any other character walking up calmly like that, or just in that way, it wouldn't. No one I, else would do it. I would have read it as like, a, oh, this person's confident about to kill him. Or, oh, this person's going to like, like the, the writing on Hanji, like I was like I knew what was gonna happen, and it was like it was just perfect. It was great. The whole like hello, like <laughs> it was amazing. I loved it. Oh, great! I'm excited to see where it goes. I'm enjoying it. Me too. I just where's the scarf? That's gonna be my parting question. Luis or this, Louis? Or... I know, but there has to be some. Uh, it has to come back in the story in a very meaningful and or like really horrible way either uh Luis is gonna die while wearing it and we're gonna get like a shot of it something some the scarf has to come back in a, a very symbolic way of like happening with something big i think well it is is it fair to say that at least partly the scarf is a visual representation of if you are on Aaron's side at the moment. That's a great way to put it. That she took the scarf off. Luis was like, don't you want to wear that? You know, Aaron gave it to you. And she's like, right now, no. And now it's gone. She can't even make the... It's like now she's at... Like, okay, now I can't even choose the path of chasing after Aaron and following Aaron. Yeah. And uh, in, during this conversation with Armin, that is interesting. I will say, right? Luis has a pretty decent amount of potential to become one of my favorite characters in the show. If the next time Luis, if the next time that we see Luis, she has dyed her hair black and starts trying to act like Mikasa, I would lose my shit and think that that is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire It'd life. It'd be sad too. It would be. It'd be horrible. It'd be <laughs> like, oh no. And then she'd probably <laughs> die. Yeah, probably. Ugh. Probably. Okay. Okay. So my question, I take back my question. Cause I think that we kind of answered it for me that it was symbolic already by not being maybe, there. Maybe. Cool. But Mikasa did look for it. I don't know. Or did she just notice it wasn't there? Maybe a little bit of both. Maybe she like just looked for it in terms of like, you know, a little glance, just a making little sure parting there, glance. You know? Yeah, maybe. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and we hope to see you next time.